What's up guys, you're watching Cafe Nation and I'm your host Brandon Davenport. We're here in lovely Seattle and today we're going to go meet up with the folks at the La Marzocco headquarters, Cafe Ladro and Cafe Vita. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. The first order of business in Seattle was to visit the American Distribution Headquarters of the La Marzocco Factory. Can I make a cappuccino? Yeah, go for it, man. Sweet. La Marzocco is one of the leading manufacturers of quality espresso machines. Cheers. Cheers. Their production factory is located in Florence, Italy, but their distribution headquarters is located in Seattle and comprised of a team of only 23 people. We met with Scott from La Marzocco, who had a lot of knowledge about the company and the machines as well. Ken Pock, he's the CEO of La Marzocco International. Okay. Um, he and Marzocco combined sort of have one of the largest privately held collections of espresso machines. So this is just a little sort of snippet of what's in the collection. Wow, I didn't even notice this Gigantor right yeah. there. Yeah. What on earth? So the Gigantor is <laughs> a uh, 1960s six group Gaja. Um, and what's really interesting is back at this point, this was before any of the awesome thermal stability stuff really came into the market. Yeah. So you would have six groups because after about two shots on any one group, the thing would overheat. One of the more interesting ones, if you look above that, uh, to that Pavoni above it, the, yep, the, um, you see how there's that door right there? Uh -huh. That's for charcoal briquettes. Really? That machine ran on charcoal. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's really impressive. And then, my favorite in the collection, that old sort of junky looking thing, yeah. is a uh, 1917 Pavoni. So that machine is from the first decade of espresso existing. Yeah. And that's really just a, sort of a time capsule and those pre-war machines yeah. are incredibly it rare to actually see. actually looks like a time capsule. Yeah. So this is our bench testing department and it will be these eight benches right here. We have two guys, uh, Victor and Zach, who come in and every day their whole job is to take the machines that have been made at our factory in Florence, bring them in here, uh, take them out of the box, and run them for a day. Make sure everything's perfect, they tune some things, they tweak some things for the U.S. market specifically, and then they put their signature on it and send it off to its final home. When you make something by hand, it has some natural variation in it, so we just want to make sure that everything is absolutely spotless before it goes out. This is Victor Franco. He's our lead bench tester. Hi, Victor. So when you see a VF, a it, ZF is uh, Zach, so that's our other bench chester. If there's a, a VF, that's Victor Franco, and that means machine passed through his hands before it came so to you. So if I go home and I take apart my Marzocco, I'm going to see yours or the ZF on there? Yep. Yeah, so on a Linea, it'll be probably like the that. same spot as a GB5. I'm look for it. <laughs> so right on this bar here you'll usually is where they'll sign it. So right about here, mm -hmm. and same spot on Alenia. We set off to Cafe Ladro in the Fremont area to meet with Jared, Cafe Ladro's director of coffee. When you start talking about sort of giving farmers and producers the justice that they deserve for producing the kind mm -hmm. of coffees that we all appreciate, I think it's sort of hard to argue the fact that roasting them lighter does a better job kind of giving them the attention mm -hmm. that they deserve. After opening their first shop in 1994 and expanding to over a dozen locations in the Seattle area, Jared was one of the guys responsible for bringing Cafe Ladro into the roasting business in 2011. It's all about community, it's yeah. all about quality, and it's all about having fun. Yeah. Salute. Salute. We head over to Cafe Vita to meet the dudes behind this awesome coffee roaster. They have a roaster in Seattle, New York, and another in Portland, as well as shops in Brooklyn and Los Angeles. We got to talk to Mike, the founder, Bob, the head of marketing and promotions, and Daniel, the man who sources Cafe Vita beans straight from the farms. A Pac Noir is, our, is the Cafe Vita signature drink. It's a, it's a, it's a four ounce drink that's a espresso, a little half and half, and I'll, a little I'll, milk. I'll take one of those too. That's beautiful. To kind of compliment it. That's the Pac Noir. It's what I've up to date called a Northwest Macchiato. <laughs> the Northwestern Macchiato, I mean. The Pac Noir. The Pac Noir. I like that name a little better. Yeah. A little more fancy, huh? S sourcing beans is interesting to me. How do you how can you tell whether your bean is gonna roast well or not? You know, there are things when you're visiting farms that are good indicators for quality. Mm -hmm. You never know whether a coffee's gonna work until you actually roast it and taste yeah. it. Yeah but there are a lot of other factors you're looking at. 
in a lot of situations I have an exporter I'm working with or uh -huh. somebody who has a sample roaster but in a lot of cases I'm taking green samples back in my backpack and roasting them okay. in Seattle. So and then you and I'll do both. And yeah, either way. Those, there's a series of feedback that happens. I mean you, you maybe cup coffee there, you maybe taste it roasted. Mm -hmm. You definitely bring samples back and then you keep working with more and more samples because the sample might represent a day's harvest, it might represent a whole cooperative and forty thousand pounds of coffee. So yeah. So you guys have pretty long-term relationships with your farmers, or? Yeah, many of them seven, ten years longer. Yeah. Rad. You guys invited us to check out the roastery on Capitol Hill, and it was quite impressive. This is our Del Sol. You see it. This is our espresso that we serve at all of our cafes. It's the backbone of Cafe Vita. Once you get, get in here and get your nose right in there. Wow, holy shit. Oh my god, right? Oh my god, that? yes. That's... Peanut butter, nutter butter. This is like a nutter butter cookie from totally. when I was a kid. 5,000 pounds a day. God damn. This is a 60 kilo roaster. We get a little over 90 pounds of batch out of this wow. one. Uh, finished coffee. I mean, everyone seems to be in love with the, yeah. the vintage roasters, you know, and I'm trying to figure out exactly, what, I mean, what, why it be it's a new roaster, you know? I mean, the era of manufacturing and certain things were made really well during certain eras, you know. Yeah. Just I think the time and place of the the people who were working on the machines just yeah. having it down, you know. Totally. Having it all dialed in. Nick is just he's looking for the plumpness of the beans, the color change, you know, everything's lots happening right here, right to this to this end. At what stage in the roasting would you consider the most important? I mean and I'm talking all stages, the after burning process, the cooling process, the the most important stage is when you decide to drop the roast, I mean, really. 